Welcome back, everybody. I have been out of town for the last couple of days, went out of town for the Super Bowl, and to be able to see my parents and, and my sister and brother-in-law and everybody and watch the game with them. Um, my parents kind of live out in the middle of nowhere, so there's not a whole lot to do out there, and you don't really get internet unless you're right in their house. And I try to sort of like disconnect and get away from everything while, you know, when I go there anyway. So um, it was a good trip. I'm glad to be back. But sorry, I've been out of pocket the last few days. I got a video. Actually, I've gotten a bunch of videos sent to me since I was gone. I'm going through and looking at all of them, putting, you know, writing them down, trying to get them in some sort of order and all that. Uh, but today we're going to do a quick video. It's the history of Texas in 11 minutes. I have no idea where this is going to start or what, you know, what history they're specifically talking about, um, whether it's more recent or it goes, you know, way, way, way back um, to way before it was Texas. We'll see. Um, the only thing, you know, there, there are quite a few things that are Texas is sort of known for, but one of the big things is there's a theme park here called Six Flags. Um, and it's specifically in reference to the six flags of Texas, the six, um, you know, different flags that, that the state flew under or country flew under, you know, depending on the time period. So, um, but let's go ahead and jump into it. History of Texas in 11 minutes. Home of the fastest road in the USA, the largest state capitol building in the nation, and a mass bigger than any country in Europe, Texas has a history almost as large as everything in it. The history of the great state of Texas technically begins at around 9,200 BC at least. Paleo-Indians were the early inhabitants of the territory, and by the first AD years, Texas boasted a considerable indigenous population already. By the time the North American continent began to be colonized, there were about six main native cultural groups in Texas alone. This meant that the fate of the early European colonists would depend vastly on how the locals responded to their presence. The first European explorer to map the Texas Gulf Coast was Alonso Alvarez de Pineda in 1519. Although it wouldn't be for nearly another decade until a Spaniard actually journeyed into the North American interior, and thus, Texas. This next expedition began in 1528 under the lead of Panfilo de Narvez, but quickly turned into an utter disaster. Hurricanes and savage storms battered the expedition and sunk two of the fleet ships, killing already a good chunk of the initial 600 men. The survivors were still aimed for a landing in modern-day Tampico, Mexico, but as luck would have it, they were instead blown off course toward Florida, not far off from today's Tampa Bay. Now, Narvez opted to divide his troops into two groups, one on land and one still on the ships, to explore the northern coast of Florida. These expeditions were intended to meet up once more at an unspecified harbor, but yet again, the plan would... Yeah, this is, you know, the Gulf of Mexico is known for some decent hurricanes, and if you, you know, there are some bad situations that have happened around places like Galveston, you know, places further south, um, Corpus Christi, that sort of thing. I, I don't know. Seems like it could, you know, this could have happened a, a bunch throughout history and it not be really anything particularly odd. Would fail. There was no harbor where the fleet could dock and the 300 who had traveled by land were under siege from the local indigenous tribes, as well as from starvation and disease. These explorers were dying by the masses now, and only a few months later, around 90 remained. Conditions were no better than thus far, however, and when the final group of explorers were swept onto Galveston Island, they were swiftly abducted by the natives, and more would continue to succumb to disease, starvation, 
and now the harsh conditions of their new situation. Eight years later, 90 became four. Alvar yes. Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, Andres Dorantes de Carranza, and his slave Estevanico, and Alonso del Castillo Maldonado were the only remaining members of Narvez's journey. The final survivors attempted on their own to explore what they could of the modern southwestern portion of the United States and the very top. That's sort of incredible that the whole expedition is down to four people and then they decided they were just going to go and and see what they could. Like that's that's kind of bizarre. Although they may not have had much of a choice now that now that I think about it. I'm not sure exactly how they were going to get back anywhere. They've only got four people, so maybe this was just kind of, you know, they were stuck here. There wasn't really anything they could do, and they thought, all right, well, we might as well go out and, and, and do our exploring. Top of Mexico, but they would soon join ranks with a group of slave catchers they found in Sinaloa, in 1536. Finally, the expedition would reach Mexico City, and eventually the few survivors left returned to their Spanish homes. The French, however, were no less interested than Spain. While the Spaniards failed to follow up their early expeditions with the establishment of any real settlements, the French managed to do it without even intending to. It all started in the late 1600s, when a French nobleman by the name of Robert Cavalier de la Salle decided to explore along the Mississippi River with the purpose of finding a way to create a better buffer between France's North American territories and those belonging to Spain. Stumbling across the Gulf of Mexico, La Salle would soon claim the whole of the Mississippi River Valley for France. After returning to France, he then attempted to convince the king to set up a settlement at the mouth of the Mississippi to help fend off the nearby Spaniards in addition to trying to convert more of the indigenous population to French Christianity. When Yeah, the French were actually pretty smart on how they went about this. And this isn't really like this part isn't specific to Texas. This is more of a general U.S. like this is how... You know, this back and forth here is what leads into what eventually will become, you know, the the Seven Years' War, or here over here it's referred to as the French and Indian War, that portion of it is, um, and the American Revolution. This all is where this kind of starts to domino, and you kind of see the layout of the different countries for North America and, and Central and South America. King Louis XIV finally gave his approval, La Salle was sent back to begin the colony. Navigational faults would eventually lead La Salle to instead create a settlement further west off the coast of Mexico, but this colony would scarcely survive three years before finally succumbing to incursions from the natives, disease, and other difficulties. The Spanish would soon hear of the French colony nonetheless, and decided that they should remove this thorn which has been thrust into the heart of America. However, the Karen Kawa and disease had already done so for them. Realizing the collapse of France's settlement and the possibilities now to found a Spanish one, Alonso de Leon was sent off to first establish a mission in eastern Texas in 1690. This launched a period of on-off interest in Texas by Spain as clashes with the natives seemed to continuously dissuade the Spaniards from doing much more. Real efforts appeared to only come in the early 18th century, after a Franciscan missionary attempted to seek support from the French for establishing new missions in Texas. Spain would almost immediately move to reoccupy the territory and keep the French out, which they did fairly well. At least, they were better at defending themselves from the French than from the local indigenous. Those yeah, and what you see here, basically all of South and Central America, not, not all of, but a good, good portion of it, they gained their independence from Spain, and 
that's sort of where their own history starts. So in the case of Texas, it's not really Texas that gains its independence from Spain like the other Central and South American countries. It's Mexico. And Texas at the time is a part of Mexico. So Mexico claims its independence. And then when the when the Texas Revolution starts, it's not against Spain. It's against the pretty newly formed Mexico. Um, but this is kind of where it all starts is you know, everybody trying to get out from under the, the cloak of the Spanish, at least down here in the, the southern area. Still at odds with various local tribes, in 1762, Spain was finally able to convince the French to relinquish all claims to the Texas territory at the end of the Seven Years' War. The Mexican War of Independence would secure much of Spain's former North American colonies as the new state of Mexico in 1821. Texas would be part of this infant country, and the Mexican... Look at the territory that they have right there. I mean, seriously, look how far up they, they go into what is now the modern-day U.S. That is a ton of territory. How different, you know the world would look right now if that stayed anywhere near the same size as that. The government quickly blasted open the door for immigration as they hopes to bring in more settlers to counteract the effects of the angry natives. But with the growing population also came growing unrest. And by eight Yeah, so you have, the basically a deal was worked out here. You have people like Moses Austin, Stephen F. Austin, who they're, they're sort of working with the, the Mexican state in order to colonize Texas with Americans. And so they're trying to bring these colonizers down and, and build up the population because what Mexico sees here is like a what could potentially be a gold mine because it's this huge territory, but there's just almost nothing in it right now. So what do we have a, a lot of? We have land. And what do we need? We need people to make this like, you know, to, to basically to make this worth it money-wise. So they start basically giving land to these guys that are pulling in these, these people to come down. And also, they're selling this land to those people, to the people that are convinced to, to move down, the, the other colonizers. They are selling the land to them just dirt, dirt cheap, um, you know, because it's a good deal for Mexico and because they have a ton of land with no people. They need people to make this work in a, in a money sense. So that's sort of the, the rough outline of the deal that's worked out here and how the population grows the, the way it does. 1836, a new Texas government was formed and a declaration of independence from Mexico followed. The new Republic of Texas would host the infamous Battle of Alamo in short order, a bloody massacre of Texas defenders that lit a passion under many Texans who were now even more determined to fight the Mexicans. The Texas Revolution subsequently would be successful in the end, although the independence fighters opposing what they saw as the tyrannical rule of Mexico soon voted in favor of becoming a part of the United States. Ironically, the latter didn't even want Texas at first. Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren shot down the idea initially, but pressure from Great Britain for Texas to remain sovereign frankly pushed the Americans towards annexation. Fin this was... The, it, it was not like everybody in Texas was pushing for this. Um, in fact, one of the most prominent Texans of the time was pretty vehemently opposed to to this idea he wanted texas to remain an independent nation um but there there was eventually the the side of joining the u.s won out um but it was a it was a sort of polarizing issue of the time you could say finally in 1845 both congresses approved the move and texas thus became a state of the USA. 
This, not surprisingly, triggered discord between America and Mexico over territorial disputes that would initiate the start of the Mexican-American War. Though, in the end, Mexico would technically receive money in exchange for the full American ownership of Texas as well as other ceded territories, there wasn't much of an option left by the time the war was over. Originally, Texas had actually laid claim to these additional ceded territories, which are now part of modern-day Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. But Texas would eventually relinquish yeah, it's all Texas. That's what they were saying. Linquish these claims to the federal government with a compromise of 1850, and barely over a decade later, in a drastic turn of events, Texas chose to leave the United States entirely. With the Civil War coming ever closer, a period of panic erupted in Texas, becoming known as the Texas Troubles. There had been rumors of enslaved people suddenly starting fires throughout the state, which led to lynching mobs and a heavier push against the abolitionist beliefs of the Union. This would eventually push Texas to hold a vote concerning secession from the United States, which found a whopping 76% of Texans in favor of leaving. As a result, Texas officially seceded and instead decided to join the Confederate States of America, a drastic change from its prior pleas to be annexed. Throughout the war, Texans who even still loosely supported or wished to be part of the Union faced severe consequences for their dissension, particularly those of the German and Mexican districts, and in Cook County in particular. In the latter, over 100 Union supporters were arrested, while over 60 of those were executed. Civil War Texas was plagued with such massacres of Unionists, and even after the Emancipation Proclamation and Juneteenth marks the end of hostilities in one form, it also triggered a new wave of violence and outrage from Confederate veterans. Nevertheless, Texas would officially rejoin the United States of America. Yeah, so a couple of things. One, the initial kind of push and pull with with Texas and Mexico was not solely about slavery, but slavery played a big part of that initial sort of conflict. Um, and then, yeah, throughout this whole time period, there is a lot of turmoil intrastate where it's not just fighting you know, the union or, you know, whatever. There is a lot of internal fighting in Texas. And actually, I had a, I had a professor in college who actually wrote a book about this. Um, that's just an incredible book. And it had a ton of stuff in it that I had no idea about. But this particular back and forth conflict in the state itself goes on for long, long after the war is over. Um, you have mass, you know, a, a couple of different like mass exodus of Texans who are just tr trying to, they're basically fleeing the state. Um, it's just uh, the story itself is, is crazy. But yeah, this is, this goes on for a long time, has been going on since, be you know, before this exact time period. And uh, it's definitely a, it's a it's a rough spot in in Texas history. On March 30th, 1870, the following phase of Texas's history marked a time of difficult reconstruction. Racial divides caused the once 90 percent black Republican Party in Texas to lose power to the white Democrats. This also coincided with a new movement within the Republican Party that aims to remove the freed slaves from power in the party, with all of this reflecting the overall ongoing racial conflict throughout the former Confederate state. These challenges would stretch into the 20th century as Texas struggled to stabilize itself socially within the Union. Hurricanes, drought, and the JFK assassination would additionally plague the great state of Texas over the next century, making it a tough ride for Texans still. Okay, so that was the history of Texas in 11 minutes. The, the hurricanes are 
you know, like I said earlier, they're decently common. There have been some really destructive hurricanes in the history of Texas. Um, you know, there's the places off the coast are often built as best they can to try to withstand hurricanes, but it just, it turns into a shit show, you know, anytime there's a big one that comes through. The JFK assassination, I, I guess that, you know, it was a big deal to everybody in the U.S. I don't know if it happening in Texas was like some sort of huge thing personally like against the state or like that the state had something to move past in a way that was far different than the rest of the country. I feel like generally it was just really hard for the country to get past um, and maybe a, a bit more so because it happened in Texas but you know across the board it was a it was a hard thing to deal with but uh, that was a good video real quick uh, you know general information I kind of wish they would have started a little bit closer to modern history and then gotten a little bit more in depth instead of going you know all the way back to whenever it was I can't remember off the top of my head 5800 BC 9800 BC I don't I don't remember off the top of my head when it first first started but um, again good video I've got a couple of other ones that I'm looking at trying to get out uh, so be on the lookout for those. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. And I will see you all next time.